Wonderful words of life. That's what Scripture is. And we are delighted for that music and for the opportunity to raise our voices to the Lord in song. Thus far, we have talked about uh, several items about Scripture itself and how we are to use the Bible because of what it is, and we ought to thank God for the Bible because of what it is, the origin of the Bible, the source of the Bible, the authority of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, and fifthly, I want us to talk about the inspiration of the Bible. Now, we've already done that to some extent because I took you to John 14, 15, and 16 to talk about the fact that Jesus was promising through the coming ministry of the Holy Spirit to inspire the apostles and those closely associated with them to actually write the bulk of the New Testament. And that inspiration from God to these Bible writers ensured that what we have in the biblical text is the word of the living God. There is also in this doctrine of inspiration another crucial passage that I think we ought to go to, and that is in 2 Peter. So if you have your Bibles there, I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 This is a profound passage of Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1 that speaks of this dual authorship of Holy Scripture, dual authorship meaning God and these human Bible writers. That is, the Holy Spirit is inspiring these Bible writers to write what they wrote so that what is given through those writings is rightly called the inspired word of the living God. Even though the writing is coming through human authors. Now there are a lot of people who would say, Well, because it comes through the human authors and humans are flawed, then the Bible must have flaws in it because humans had a part in the writing of the Bible. And that has been something that through the ages, very, very sound theologians and very, very careful theologians have given very, very good answers uh, to those questions or those doubts that people often have. And I think 2 Peter chapter 1 from Scripture itself gives us a marvelous understanding of these things. Look at 2 Peter 1 with me. You know that in the first part of this first chapter of 2 Peter, Peter begins to describe something that personally happened to him that we know as the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before these three disciples who would later become, of course, apostles to the Lord Jesus, Peter being one of them. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, The Bible says, his divine power, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
And then beginning in verse 5 and going through verse 15, Peter begins to talk about the implications of how Holy Scripture, these divine things, this knowledge of God, allows us to grow in Christ conformity. And as he goes through the rest of that section, which we'll not read together, he then moves to this experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he says, according to 2 Peter 1.16, for we, talking about this sort of inner apostolic band, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that signals, that clues us in that Peter is about to talk about that experience that day on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus, as it were, opened his flesh and showed this brilliance, this bright shining uh, glory that was so shocking, so brilliant, that it says that it was so white, it was whiter than any launderer could make white on the earth. Isn't that amazing? Whatever that was, whatever that experience was by way of the eyes, it was brilliant. It was captivating. And this is what Peter's talking about. How do I know that? Verse 17. For when he received glory, honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And you see, he's describing that very time, that very experience, that very moment where Jesus was transfigured. We could call this transfiguration of Jesus at that moment, long before he'd ultimately go to the cross, we could call that previews of coming attractions. This was, this was Jesus allowing these three men, and of course Moses and Elijah, because uh, they were talking to Jesus in this very moment, these men were seeing the glory, the majestic glory of Christ being unfolded prior, of course, until even his coming again to the earth when he comes in his second coming glory, which is, of course, still even future to us. And Peter is talking about this experience. And he says, verse 19, and we have something more sure. Now stop right there. I mean, that, that is an astounding statement. You say, what's so astounding about it? Well, if Peter has just finished talking about this, this experience on the mount that was so white, so bright, so brilliant, so incredibly stupendous that it can hardly be described. Then he goes on to say that there's actually, even though he's had that experience, he was there, he saw it, that there's something even greater than that. That's what he's saying. What is greater than that? He says we have something more sure or a more sure word, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. In other words, think about the illustration he's just used there. A lamp 
shining in a dark place, as it refers here to Holy Scripture. Can you imagine the Apostle Peter saying now, many years after the experience of being on that Mount of Transfiguration, I'm going to tell you about two experiences. One, the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration, where I saw the brightest, whitest, most stupendous experience I've seen yet in my lifetime, and that was the effulging glory, the, the whiteness of the vision of Jesus Christ manifested as God of very God, as the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about something that's even brighter than that. And what is that that's brighter than that? Notice what he says. You would do well with a more sure word of prophecy to pay attention to a lamp shining in a dark place. What is that lamp? The lamp is our Bible. The lamp is God's word. That lamp is the written revelation of God's word in the holy book. That's what he's referring to. You say, where do you get that? Notice what he says. You should do well to pay attention, verse 19, as to a lamp, the Bible, God's word, his written revelation, which is shining in a dark place, that is the dark place of this world, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that first of all, that no, no, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, that's how I know he's talking about Scripture, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along, born along, moved along. This, my friends, is the doctrine of the Bible's inspiration. This is holy men. He, he, he talks about the prophetic word produced through prophecies, God prophesying through men, producing not their own ideas, not their own visions, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These prophets, these prophetical writers, these Bible writers, these men who took pen to paper that we have the beneficiary opportunity to read ourselves even thousands of years later, we have the written version of what they were born along by the Holy Spirit to write. The Word of God. And that Word of God, according to this passage, is a lamp shining in a dark place because the morning star, Jesus Christ, is the one who tasked the Holy Spirit to bring these men along like a, like a ship in the harbor and the wind was the Holy Spirit moving the ship along as the writing process was taking place. That's what was going on. These men were inspired by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't produced by their own will, it says, but men spoke, because they were prophets, spoke from God. 
as they were borne along by the wind of the Spirit to write what they wrote. And no wonder in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about their opposites, false prophets, false teachers, those who aren't born along, those, those who do have their own opinions and their own will, and all they're attempting to do is deceive and mislead the people of God. So when, when I talk about you know, the origin of the Bible and the source of the Bible and the inerrancy of the Bible and those other things we've covered, we're really talking about this fully bright revelatory word from God that you and I possess and hold in our very hands. Is that not incredible to think about? Do you, do you wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to read God's holy word? I, I, want, I want to know him. I, I want to have him give me his word as a word of counsel to my soul. To correct me. To... to bear me up, to encourage me, to convict me, to challenge me, to change me, so that this inspired word gives me the comfort I so desperately need and the direction I so delectably desire. This is, this is what we're talking about in the process of of God producing his infallible, inerrant word. It is unerring, infallible, that it is totally truthful. There is no lie. It is all truth. It will all come to pass. And it is inspired by God. I mean, you and I, we have... Nothing but to thank God for his inerrant, inspired, and yes, this grand experience that's even more grand than watching the transfiguration of Jesus Christ on a mountain. That is amazing. And, and to think... Here's another word, the canon of the Bible, or the canonicity of the Bible. This is another in our list. To think that God painstakingly has put together two places, the canon of the Old Testament and the canon of the New Testament, the 39 books of the Old, the 27 books of the New, so that his revelation of himself and of his plan and for the people of the world to understand, to live out, to be guided by is given to us in the Old and New Testaments of the Holy Scripture. Now some people really struggle with this idea of canonicity. And it's admittedly a challenge because in the canon of the Old Testament, canon, by the way, is simply a word that means rule or standard. So the standard of the holy writings, the rule of the holy writings is, in fact, nothing but the 39 books of the Old Testament. Not 40, not 38. You can walk into, say, Barnes and Noble, and you will see on the shelves, even up to this very moment, 
I often like to go into Barnes & Noble and say, what heresy is being promoted these days? And you look in the religion section of Barnes & Noble, and you will often see in that religion section new volumes of those who are writing on these subjects and just look in that section and you'll find something like this, the lost books of the Bible. It'll be, that'll be one of the titles. You've probably seen it. Or it'll say, the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And these are whole books that have been written by authors who are trying to foist upon you and me that the church, the capital C church, is trying to mislead you by keeping you from knowing certain other things about the world and about the past and about the church and about the Bible that the church has selectively withheld certain Bible books from you so that you may not read them. And that's what they intend to deceive you by. And it's, it's amazing how many people fall prey to such a thing. But the canon of Scripture, the rule, the standard of what constitutes these holy writings is complete with the 39 books of our Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament. And even if you, and many of you probably are, coming out of a Roman Catholic background, would also realize that when you were growing up and perhaps you had a Bible that might have been given to you either by family or by the church that included a section in the Bible, quote unquote, that was beyond the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New, namely a section that's called the Apocrypha. How many of you have seen that? Probably even read sections out of it. They are historical books, but they're not biblical books. They don't belong in our Bible as though they are a part of sacred writings. They are not. They might have some level of value in terms of their historical importance, but they certainly aren't a part of holy scripture. The canon, the standard, the rule has been determined and not by a cloistering of, of some uh, steely-eyed persons who were trying to control uh, Christians around the world or they were trying to uh, sort of play fast and loose with uh, their authority and trying to make people think that uh, they really had the secret knowledge of what belongs as books in the Bible and which ones don't and therefore you ought to uh, really trust us uh, that these are the real books of the Bible and the others are spurious books of the Bible. No, it wasn't the church that came up with the Bibles that we have in our Old and New Testaments. They were simply recognized for what they are, the Word of God. All those others, including the Apocrypha, including other writings, as I mentioned as examples before, didn't pass the test because they weren't recognized as having come from the divine author, God himself, through inspired writers to be listed among those 66 books of the Bible. Therefore, they are not to be considered divine in their origin, and they do not take the cake when it comes to to the canonicity of the Bible, the standard, the rule of what's to be there and what is not to be there. They didn't make it. They're not divine. They're not binding. So, what do we say about that? Well, 
The very next in our list is the, the sufficiency of the Bible. That's the next on our list, the sufficiency of the Bible. Why? Because right alongside the idea of what is the true standard, what is the rule, the, the canon of our Bibles, 39 of the old, 27 of the new, and if someone comes along and says, nope, nope, you've got to include the Apocrypha, or you've got to include the missing uh, Gospel of Thomas, or the missing Gospel of Judas, or some other spurious document, even the, the Gnostic writings of the second century and beyond. Yes, we've got to include those too, because they're not only historically relevant, they're, they're also very necessary for us to know God and to live rightly in God's kingdom. Well, you know what you're saying by that argument? You're saying by that argument that the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament that we have are insufficient. They're not sufficient enough. We need more. God has been either holding out on us or man has been holding out on us. Certain men in a conclave somewhere decided, and frankly, I'm mad about it, who gave them the right to determine what's in the Bible or not? If that argument is true, then that means that the Bible that you and I possess, 39, 27, is insufficient. And you and I have been left out with regard to more divine information from God himself. Because if human beings out there are saying, these Bible books have been lost, now they've been regained. These Bible books have, should have been in our canon since the very beginning. Someone is messing with us. Someone is deceiving us. What does that say about the doctrine of God? What does that say about God's will and purpose to include everything we needed in our Bible that would give us a sufficient rule for life? You think that God isn't powerful enough? He isn't strong enough? He isn't wise enough to help us know beyond the shadow of a doubt what is to be in our Bibles? You mean to tell me that the Lord God of the universe couldn't keep the spurious Bibles out of our canon? and put in the right books to our canon? He couldn't do it? Was he not powerful enough? Was he not wise enough? Was he not able to, to make sure that the Bible that we hold in our hands, the 66 books of the Bible, is in fact and only is the Word of God? I mean, if I walked into Barnes and Noble and saw these books on a shelf, and if I didn't know better, and if I didn't know the character of God, and if I thought God couldn't prevent something, or he couldn't figure out how to place these Bibles that they say ought to be in our canon, then what does that say about the character of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God? He doesn't have it. He's not capable. If, if, if long ago certain books didn't make it into the canon and now we've found them, that that means that God couldn't figure out a way to give us the totality of his revelation? My beloved friends, not on your life. God loves us. He cares for us. He's going to give us what we need. And what he's given us in the 66 books of our Bibles is 
sufficient. Did I not just read to you here in 2 Peter chapter 1? Look back at it, chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power, God the Father and the Lord Jesus, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, where has he granted it to us? The next phrase, through the knowledge of him. How do we attain that knowledge? Through the word. That's the only place. Through God's word. Through the written scripture. That's where that knowledge comes. The knowledge that he's called us to his own glory and excellence and by which he's granted to us his precious and very great promises. Where do we find those precious and great promises? God's word. God's word. Only God's word. They're not available anywhere else. They're not available in visions. They're not available in miraculous works that someone drops down like the Mormons think, a a, a new book called the Book of Mormon? Uh, uh, Another book? Not just the Book of Mormon, but Doctrine and Covenants? And, and, And then a third book that God sort of just dropped in the lap of Joseph Smith, the Pearl of Great Price? Do you realize that? Do you realize that Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, believe? that there are four sources of divine truth and revelation? The 66 books of the King James Version of the Bible, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Book of Mormon. And they believe that those are on a par with the 66 books of the Bible. Or how about the Jehovah's Witnesses with their translation, the translations of the New World translation of the Holy Bible. And they've been messing around with that and jockeying it to fit their spurious doctrines. You see, none of that can compare to the precious and great promises that God has given us in His Word. Which means that the Bible is, that is, the 66 books of the Bible are completely and totally sufficient. We don't need anything else. We don't need Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the New World Translations of the Holy Scriptures of the Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't need those. We don't need uh, visions and prophecies in the present day. This is the prophetic word. This is what we need. You say, well, wait, 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 wait. Okay, if if the canon is closed, if the rule, the standard, is these 66 books of the Bible, we, we can't be led to believe that there are lost books of the Bible. We can't be led to believe that there are other books like the Mormons, like the JWs and others would want us to to see additional revelation, then how is it that I can understand the 66 books of the Bible? Well, here's another characteristic. Let's call it the illumination of the Bible. The illumination of the Bible. You realize that what God does when he illumines his truth for us so that we can understand his truth that we are given illumination from his word. He he illumines our minds to understand. Let's go in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and I'll show you this quickly and easily about how our Bibles can be illumined to our sufficient understanding. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
This is, this is so helpful. This is so necessary. This is where biblical counseling and biblical preaching and biblical fellowship comes into play because the Lord is going to help us by his illumining our minds to a correct understanding of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's what it says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says in verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, we could maybe even more properly call this the regenerating light of God. The doctrine of regeneration. Where, where once Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Or, because that word um, is, I think, probably better translated for us, you must be born from above. The Greek word is anathen. And, and it means that we have to be born again or born from above by the Spirit. And that's why Jesus goes on in John 3 to tell Nicodemus that this work of, of following Christ, of seeing Christ's Lordship, of, of having your sin dealt with, is not going to happen unless God chooses to open blind eyes. It's not something we generate on our own. It's something that God has to regenerate in our souls. And when he says to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, he says, and here's how it happens, Nicodemus, you have to be born of water and spirit. And when he uses that, he undoubtedly is referring to Ezekiel 36 and 37. No wonder he says to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? How, how could you not understand it? You've been teaching Ezekiel 36 and 37 to all of the Israelite people because you're the teacher of Israel and you're telling me that you don't understand that you must be born of water. What does that mean? Well, in Ezekiel 36, it says, God the Spirit will sprinkle clean water on you. That's what he means. The, the washing, Titus 3, 5, of regeneration. The washing of it. Our minds need to be washed away of the filth and the regeneration of your soul. We are born again. We're born from above. And it says in Ezekiel 36 and 37, like when it talks in chapter 37 about the, the dry bones, the dead men's dry bones, and that's a picture of Israel. And the prophecy is by Ezekiel, God speaking through him, that there's going to be a time, a time in the future, in which these dry bones will actually have their, their skeletal remains, their sinews, they will, they will be, be brought back together. And he gives an object lesson to Ezekiel and he says, go over there, touch these dry bones, and the Spirit will bring them back all together. It's kind of like a regeneration slash resurrection. Israel will come back to life. God is not finished with the state of Israel. He's not finished with it. 
and they will be born again, born from above through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, water and spirit. And so, when, when this illumination is a kissing cousin of this idea of 2 Corinthians 4, we know that because look at chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But God, but thanks be to God, chapter 2, verse 14, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And here's, here's this dynamic that happens according to verse 16 that whether you believe it or not this is what God's word has to say to one the gospel is a fragrance from death unto death to the other a fragrance from life to life who is sufficient for these things you know what he's saying the same gospel The same thing that chapter 4 says God can use to regenerate the hardest heart is also the same gospel that hardens the clay. It's a sweet aroma, this gospel, that can bring someone from death life to sweet aroma of eternal life. But the same gospel that opens up the heart of stone is the gospel also that can cause someone to even be more angry, more shallow, more clay-like. You heard that illustration that the same sun can melt the wax but also harden the clay. Yes, that's what the gospel does. So if that's true, who's in charge? God is in charge. God determines. You say, well, how do you even know these things? How do you know that chapter 4 says this and it means this and chapter 2 is here and it means this because of 1 Corinthians 2? Look over there, 1 Corinthians 2. All of this that you're hearing me teach, all of these interpretations of these passages, and all of the things that God's word, its origin, its source, its authority, its inerrancy, its inspiration, its canonicity, its sufficiency, and its illumination comes to us because God is pleased to grant us a knowledge of these things. Look at chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice what it says. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand or be illumined by the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom. You see, that's exactly what 2 Peter 1 meant when it says no prophecy is made by the will of man, but the prophecy from God. This is the same thing. These are the Bible writers who are saying when we impart to you God's word as we've written it to you, it's not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. You have to be spiritual to, in order to understand spiritual things. No wonder he goes on to say in verse 14, the natural person 
does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But, look at this, verse 15, the spiritual person, the Christian, he or she judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Nobody. But we have been given the illumining mind of Christ. You see, as Christians, we have been given illumination by the Spirit as spiritual persons, as Christians, so that we can understand the things of God. Namely, we can understand the things of His Word. You ought to, you ought to pray every day that when you open your Bible, you would say exactly what Psalm 19 is saying. Almost every single word of Psalm 119, 176 verses. But listen to what it says in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And verse 105. Your word is is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Do you see what the psalmist is saying? He's saying, Lord, I want you to open my mind, illumine my heart, so that I can understand your word. There are times as a pastor when I sit with someone who's asking for counsel, and we're talking, and usually we're talking about things that are very unnerving to them. They're, they're in a state of flux, and they're needing help, and they're very emotional, and, and they've got issues that they're trying to grapple with, spiritually speaking. And I'm saying to myself, Lord, apart from you, I don't know how to help them. I don't, I don't know what to say. Unless your word illumines my heart, unless you give me from your word the help that that person needs and they're coming to me because they believe I will help meet that need, I can't do it on my own. I can't give them the counsel that they need. I, I have to have your word. This is, this is God's word that gives me all that I need. This is, this is a word about the word that when God illumines my heart to understand the word, I can help anyone. You and I can help anyone. We may not share everything that needs to be shared, but if we use his word, this word, this word will give them the kind of clarity that they need to move forward. In fact, that's our next word in our list, the clarity of the Bible. The clarity of the Bible. I won't talk long about that because... It's so close to that idea of the illumination of the Bible, but it's yet different. It's something like this. The clarity of the Bible, if you want to use a big word that theologians use other than clarity, is the perspicuity of Scripture. It's perspicuous. It's clear. It's a, it's a kind of... It's a kind of window into the soul. It's a kind of clarity that allows you and me to navigate successfully through the Christian life. And it's a kind of clarity that gives us a way of helping others when their thinking 
is murky. When they're not necessarily understanding how to work their way through the trial. This is our next to last word in our list because we've run out of time. But the clarity of the Bible is going to give way to the message that I'm going to give tomorrow on trials from James chapter 1. How many of you, hands raised, how many of you have had all the answers and you've successfully navigated every trial of your Christian life? That's interesting. I don't see a single hand up. And when I, when I put mine up, I was not being truthful. Because I don't have a way of successfully navigating all my way through the trials of the Christian life successfully unless I am illumined by the Holy Spirit which brings the clarity of God's word to my heart and my actions. The clarity of Scripture. Scripture is clear. Do you remember in that book of James, later on in chapter 1, where he talks about looking in the mirror, we could call it the mirror of the word, and I'm looking at the mirror of the word, and if I don't com compellingly and completely and continually look into the mirror of the word, what happens? What does it say in that illustration? It says, if, if I look into the mirror of the word and then I quickly turn away, what's going to happen? It says, I'm going to forget what kind of person I am. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to so easily forget what the word has instilled in me, has instructed me to do. And so what I need is God's word to be so continually at my fingertips and through my eyes continually looking through the mirror so that I can gain greater, greater clarity. Greater clarity. And you know as well as I do that you cannot often gain clarity on anything unless you continue to set your mind upon figuring it out. What am I going to do? What's the right answer? What's the best decision? You say, well, I would just phone a friend. Well, that's not a bad idea, but you probably shouldn't do that first. We probably run way too often into the counsel of a friend before we exhaust the opportunity to find out what God's word says. And God has given us in his word the kind of clarity, the perspicuity, the, the, the knowledge and the transparent understanding of what you and I are supposed to do. Now, of course, it's true that we're not saying that if someone says, well, who am I to marry? What car should I buy? What, what house should we find? What job is out there for me? Well, the Bible isn't going to tell you with clarity, buy the Honda. It's not going to give you some skywriting that says, marry her. And most of the time, if the ladies are asking that question, it's not going to be sky riding. Please don't marry him. However, the clarity that is reserved in Scripture for the believer, which is the totality of it, will help you answer all of the necessary questions so that when it comes to answering those other questions that I just posed, they'll be far easier to answer.
It'll be far easier to answer. It doesn't mean it's going to be at the snap. It doesn't mean that you and I are going to have no struggle at all at times. Because remember, part of the struggle to come to the answers about a life partner, about where to live, about what major to have in college, or what job to take, that's part of the pilgrimage. It's part of the journey of the Christian life. It's, it's part of trusting God. And the clarity of his word will give you and me a way, a way forward that doesn't answer every question so that you and I don't have to think, that you and I don't have to ponder, that you and I, you and I don't have to struggle with, but the kind of clarity from his word will give you a greater opportunity to trust God with the answers that are not specifically revealed there for you personally. This is the clarity of Scripture. There are times when I have rushed headlong into making a decision when I realized after the fact I did not put enough time or effort in understanding the clear word of God in order to make a decision of that magnitude. And so I've got to back up. And I've got to say, Lord, I didn't do the work that you've called me to do. I need to be a student of scripture. I need to bathe myself in the Bible. I need to ruminate and marinate in the holy scripture. And when I do things will become more clear to me. That's the clarity of the Bible. God is not wishing to hide his will from any of us. You know, people talk about, you know, God's will is hidden and it's enigmatic and it's so hard to determine and discern. Not really. Not really in the ultimate sense. What we usually mean by that is something akin to, I need the quick answer. I need the, the quick fix. I, I, I need to be able to, to sort of navigate around this real tough spot right now, in the moment. And sometimes the tough spots are there, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. They're there to stretch and strain you so that you are left with nothing but to put your face back into the holy book. And when you do, and you find new insights, not because they weren't there before, but because you weren't in it before. And those insights can clarify, give clarity to your thinking. And I believe that's a wonderful place for the body of Christ to come to help. For instance, that's why I think the body of Christ has been formed so that we can come alongside our brothers and sisters and they can come alongside us and they can say, let me share some scripture with you. I know you're going through a tough time. I want to share with you some passages that might give you clarity in your search for wisdom. Doesn't it say in James 1.5 that if any of us lack wisdom, we can ask of God and he's not cheap? He's not going to withhold? He's not going to hold back? But he's going to give us the wisdom that we need so that clarity can be our gift. You see that? So we're left with one more for tomorrow. And I want to call that the practicality of the Bible. The practicality of the Bible. We've talked about the origin of the Bible, the source of the Bible, the authority of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, the inspiration of the Bible, the canonicity of the Bible, the sufficiency of the Bible, the illumination of the Bible, the clarity of the Bible, and finally, the practicality of the Bible. And that's James 1, and that's regarding trials. And if you want that, you're going to have to come tomorrow to church. How many are coming to church tomorrow? I hope to be here too. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time.
Thank you for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and tomorrow, ten characteristics of your beautiful, perfect word. And tomorrow shall be no different regarding the practicality of your word, the application of your word, the homework and help that we need from your word, especially for trials. May we thank you for your word and all of these characteristics that describe your word. For your honor and glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.